Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Sirius Report. My name is Ken Shorjan. I'm here with London Paul. And Paul, we've got a couple of interesting things. Uh, we have to do some updates on the Ukraine conflict. First off, it appears that Russia is now within four miles of Ukraine's last line of defense, last primary line of defense, Pokrovsk. But even more so, there's some very fascinating things that have come out regarding Nord Stream. And before I pass it over to you, I'll go ahead and read off, which this is from Politiken, one of Denmark's most important newspapers. Uh, to paraphrase it down, a few days before the explosions that destroyed the Russian-German natural gas pipelines, Nord Stream 1 and 2, uh, U.S. Navy warships were on the scene. They had switched off their transponders, and when the harbor master of Christianso Island sailed to them because he noticed and suspected an accident, the Navy ordered him to turn back immediately. Anyway, Paul, I want to thank you as always for being a part of the discussion, and welcome to the show. Yes, and thank you also for being part of the discussion equally. So yeah, we thought we'd come back to Ukraine. It's always a hot topic. There's always things to discuss, but sometimes I think there's more important things to discuss, and, and it's one of those days. And I think we'll start off with Nord Stream. Now, Nord Stream is one of the most idiotic kind of uh, situations that's ever happened in geopolitics, because the reality is everybody knows who's responsible. And yet nobody in the West all even wants to talk about it. They kind of they've tried to obviously blame Ukraine for it and made accusations that various members of, of the Kiev government were were involved and tried to do everything to deflect the blame away from the Americans. There also there's now claims that the British are involved. And the question is, is this ever going to go away? And the answer is no. I think eventually there will be a resolution. Eventually, it will be impossible to hide the reality of who is responsible specifically. And there might be a situation where there's a desire to throw one or two people under the bus. It might be a situation where that's feasible to do so. Because remember, this is throwing people under the bus in the eyes of the public. I mean, it doesn't matter in reality what, you know, what people think politically. It's all about trying to avoid a huge embarrassment, a huge fallout of effectively having to stand there and go, well, yes, we, the allies of Germany, decided to blow up a pipeline and trying to justify and explain why you did so. It's impossible. So really, it's just saving face. I think they'll have to try and craft a narrative that, that means that the likes of you and I will be satisfied that that's an acceptable claim. I don't see how anyone can, because, I mean, the point is every politician in the West knows who's responsible because the bottom line is they could they didn't try and stitch up the Russians and accuse them of doing it because, A, there's no reason at all why Russia would do it. B, they, you know, they, they would have to come up with an absolutely ridiculous explanation for why, how Russia did it. There's no evidence. They never frame Russia. And I think partly that is to do with the fact they suspect Russia has evidence and intelligence to, to understand precisely who's responsible. And maybe they're just thinking, well, if we don't accuse Russia, then maybe Russia will just leave it alone. I mean, they have dropped hints about it. But at the end of the day, it comes down to the fact at some point there will have to be an acknowledgement about who's responsible because someone's going to have to pay for the damage. Someone's going to have to reimburse the companies who were responsible for the construction at huge cost. I mean, this cost billions. So, and all the investment from Western uh, companies. So it can't just disappear and pretend it never happened. So, the day is going to come when that truth will come out. When it does, I think it's going to be very hard for them to be able to find a narrative that people are going to swallow. Because however you say, what well, are you going to do? Blame Biden and say Biden gave the instruction. None of us knew what was going on. People are not going to buy this. 
So ultimately, when the truth is no, and the wider public understands the reality, then it raises a million other questions as to, well, if they were responsible for that, what else have they been responsible for? What other huge, gigantic lies have we been told? And let's be honest, how are the German public going to respond to this? To go, well, not only will we be cut off from cheap energy, which is destroying our economy, it's deindustrializing our economy, and we're starting to see how the US is trying to hoover up German companies on the cheap in the process. I mean, this should be in reality enough to cause a massive uh, earthquake in German politics, where all those people, parties in this uh, coalition government, so-called traffic light coalition government, will be gone. Who's going to replace them? Well, that, that remains to be seen. But also the question is, how does Germany then square up the idea of being an ally with the United States. Therefore, it brings into question the future of NATO in the process. And ultimately, then the question is, does the pipeline ever get fixed? Is Russia prepared to pump cheap gas to Europe again, to, to Germany? With respect to Nord Stream, and that's a big question, that at this point we don't know the answer because by then they may say, well, we can't do this anymore because, <clears throat> excuse me, we're already selling the gas we want sold to you through those pipelines or when two of them will, were operational to other countries such as China, such as uh, Southeast Asia, etc. Because Russia's rapidly selling more and more energy to the global south. So it's an enormous problem. But quite really when you, you have to wonder what they really seriously thought uh, they were going to gain from doing this. Because at the end of the day, all they had to do was cut off the supply. They could have you know, easily just cut off gas flowing through it. So if they wanted to, to stop Russian gas reaching Germany. So it, what, it wasn't going to harm Russia in any way. Because if they don't want Russian gas, they won't get Russian gas. So they think they're going to damage them economically. But they must it must have surely have realized at some point the truth was going to come out. Although maybe the argument is they were still arrogant at that point to imagine that the West would prevail and Russia would collapse. So who cares? Well, what's the problem? I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to crush Russia and no one will care anymore about what happened with Nord Stream and we'll deal with that problem further down the line when you know we feel we've balkanized russia will control our assets and therefore it, we're in control of the energy supply from russia i mean these kind of deluded thoughts were clearly going through their heads and have been for quite quite a few years even prior to ukraine so the uh, timing again is why is it coming out now and i think at some point someone is going to break ranks and go enough's enough we're not pinning the blame on on anyone other than those responsible see what i think really is interesting is uh the attempt to balkanize russia from uh from europe has really turned the tide because europe is being hit by so many different areas uh ukraine announced this week that they are ending or when it expires they're ending the uh natural gas transit contract with Europe, which of course would go into places like uh, Hungary, Slovakia, Poland, uh, who uses needs the natural gas there on, on the eastern part of, of Europe. Then of course you have China, which is doing what the United States has done, only they're seeing that the, there's a uh, chink in the armor and where the U.S. is trying to impose uh, Europe to do the same type of tariffs against China. China is now dividing Europe uh, where Germany doesn't want to do these tariffs and France sort of wants to do the tariffs and Italy def definitely doesn't want to do the tariffs. And the EU now is trying to consolidate and centralize power and they want all tariffs along. Uh, you know, it's just insane. And it's funny how you're getting what the, the initial uh, uh, 
plan was to go after Russia and uh, disconnect them from, say, China, has now seen Europe in the complete uh, in complete chaos over what to do because they're being told one thing by the U.S. They're being one thing by Brussels. They're seeing the reality of what the Ukraine conflict has done to their economy, to their uh, energy uh, platforms and lifelines, and all across the board. And all of a sudden, they're also getting the internal of domestic unrest. They're getting the internals of political change that is being called for. And really, when you take a look at this Ukraine conflict, it's almost the, you could almost say it was the catalyst for ending the EU as we know it. Well, yeah, that was always the point, as I said on day one, uh, when the Ukraine war started, if the West is serious in implementing these sanctions, it will destroy the West, it will destroy Europe, it will be the end of the the European Union. And it was it was that obvious. And it might not have been obvious to very many other people, but it was clearly very obvious to me, but having spent years understanding how the whole geopolitical uh, system works with regards to Europe and its relations with Russia and uh, et cetera, et cetera, then there was, there was no way Europe could win out of this because at the end of the day, Europe's always been dependent on cheap Russian energy when it no longer has it, then it's in serious trouble. And, and I think with regards to the whole issue of, of what's gone on with Ukraine, it's just been one serious misunderstanding after the other. And it always comes back to the point, who in the West seriously thought that Russia, the, with the, the biggest nuclear power in the world with more missiles than anyone else, could be defeated in fighting a proxy war with Ukraine. Because if Russia had been pushed to the edge of its very existence and the threat was that existential, it's clearly stated from day one, it would resort to nuclear weapons. So it was impossible for Ukraine to ever win. As we've said before, they banked on the fact that Russia would lose rapidly because they had such an idiotic, kind of arrogant, ignorant, and this hubris that, you know, we're the West, we always win, we're so much uh, far superior in militarily and in every other capacity in fighting this war. It's it's a foregone conclusion. And, of course, it isn't. So I don't want to dwell too much on that because there's an important point to make that's happened and was supposed to happen this weekend, and there was supposed to be this Ramstein group summit that was supposed to happen on Saturday, and it was all to do with Ukraine. And there was a lot of misinterpretation where people were going, oh, this is where they're going to announce that Ukraine's going to be allowed to use long-range missiles. Ukraine is not going to be allowed to use long-range missiles. We've explained this so many times because the United States does not want an escalation that risks pitching them directly in conflict with Russia, which then risks World War III. Now, why it's telling is because there was all these statements coming out beforehand where, of course, and remember, this is just words. They're meaningless words. There's no substance to them. They're in irrelevance. And people often hear Western commentators, Western politicians, uh, ambassadors, whoever else, officials making statements and go, well, this must be true. 99% of the time, there's not an element or, of truth to anything they say. They are just words. So they came out and went, well, the West will not let, let up in its support for Ukraine. Moscow cannot hope to play for time. I don't know what the heck they think that means. And at the same time, this is the kicker. We're going to look into all avenues to find a just peace. And then it said, no decisions of peace negotiations will take place without Ukraine. And Ukraine wants a second peace summit. And, and this is a statement where it said, the US decision to deploy long-range missiles to Europe, not Ukraine, is an important message that Washington will remain engaged in protection of Europe. Now, that statement there is extremely important because that is to placate 
the growing chorus of voices inside Europe who are going, the United States is useless. It is not an ally. We're just, they're using us and abusing us as our, in our position in Europe. They're making us now effectively trying to bankroll the Ukraine war. We have got nothing out of this war except huge amount of expenditure. We've depleted our military supplies. So this is trying to uh, say, well, we'll give you these missiles because then in the future, you can fire, we'll, we'll fire them on your behalf at Russia, even though, of course, the United States will do nothing of the sort because, again, there's this whole myth that surrounding World War Three and Cold War 2.0 and how we, we're going to have a nuclear war. We're not going to have a nuclear war because the United States knows full well the outcome of that will be devastating for the US, as we said before. Now, the question is, why is this meeting being cancelled and noted indefinitely? And it's because Biden suddenly announced, well, I've got this important problem with this Hurricane Milton at home. I have to be here to deal with this. So I'm going to have to cancel this Ramstein, or me attending this Ramstein uh, uh, summit. And also, I'm not going to now go to Africa anymore because he was supposed to go to Angola. The reality is Biden could have easily sent anyone else. I mean, Blinken could have gone instead. The reason the meeting was cancelled is effectively this is the West going, or well, the Biden administration, going, we don't want any more to do with this. You know, we're a few weeks off the election. We're just not getting involved in any more discussions about this where they just want out of the war. They want the war to end because it's humiliating and embarrassing what it's done to the United States not least just with, in terms, as we said, militarily, but how it's undermining NATO. It's undermined the United States' reputation across the world. It's galvanized the global South. It's accelerated the multipolar world and many other reasons we've stated previously. So this is very telling because immediately once the US isn't showing up, then the UK doesn't, and France doesn't, and Germany doesn't, and they all just back off and go, oh, the meeting's not happening. And it's not happening because they've just reached the end of the line where there is no answer anymore to what the West can do. What the West is running out of munitions to send. It knows Ukraine is rapidly running out of military personnel. because and The desertions and people avoiding mobilisation is enormous and growing. I mean, and so that's a huge problem. And we know what's happening on with regards to the front line. You mentioned Pokrovsk, and the Russians being very close to that. Donetsk is, I think, the Ukrainians are basically on the verge of admitting they're going to lose it. Why? Because they're now building furiously fortifications in the region next door to Donetsk and the border Zaporozhye, which is Dnipro. So that's an admission, basically, we're going to lose Donetsk. They're basically also admitting uh, Zaporozhia's over. I mean, and there are reports, and they need to be verified, that Russia is now in certain parts of, of Zaporozhia, has crossed the Dnieper River, which is another very telling development. So when you stack all this up and, and the debacle that's going on in Kursk, then, you know, and Zelensky's the only one who keeps going on about how he's going to win the war and everyone knows it's nonsense. Uh, so the West has effectively just backed itself into a corner where there is no way out of this and cancelling Ramstein. It's, you know, that's as, as near as you can ever say to throwing in the towel and going, we're giving up. I mean, they'll still send bits of finance. They'll still make the right noises because they have to, because the public in Western countries are going to go, what are you doing? Are you, why aren't you supporting Ukraine? But if they had an option, they'd like to walk away from this. But here's the problem. They still think, despite all this going on, that they're going to dictate the terms of a peace agreement. They're the ones who are going to tell Russia what happens. I mean, I've even heard statements to, to the effect that the rebuilding of Ukraine is going to be done by Germany. I mean, seriously, the, the, a bankrupt nation that 
has enormous internal problems, is going to finance that how. The other problem that the West is now facing, because there's a lot of Western institutions who've heavily invested in Ukraine on the basis that there was this foregone conclusion that Ukraine would win. Well, that's clearly not going to happen. So it remains to be seen what happens in that regard, because that could cause enormous problems for, for these Western corporations and conversely Western countries. So it's an absolute mess to put it diplomatically. You could lose, use a lot stronger language, but, you know, Ramstein today uh, is just another example where go back 12 months and how the rhetoric's changed because the West understands the reality and what's going to happen. They're just now far more concerned about how we going to sell this in such a way that our political careers are not over because frankly, anyone inside the European Commission should, should be forced to resign. I think a lot of Western leaders who've been really sh shouting the odds with regards to the, should there should be some serious consideration that when in the elections in their countries in the future, why am I going to elect these people again? Because they sold us basically a complete lie. There was no way Russia could ever lose this war. They can sit there and, and, and pretend otherwise, but it's very, very clear the amount of propaganda that we've heard for so long. You know, that's all vanished and disappeared. No one talks that way anymore. In fact, Western media is now basically admitting the truth. They're dribbling stories out there in typically in newspapers and articles that are clearly it's US intelligence that's just gradually leaking the truth and the reality. But the war's long since over. And it was over before it even really got started in reality. And it's just that's the part the West doesn't understand. Russia's not trying to fight a war to, to take over the whole of Ukraine. That was never their intention. They stated what their intentions were. The West ignored it. And they're still arguing about the fact that Russia's hardly taken any territory and it's completely and utterly irrelevant. Yeah, in the end, historians are going to look back and see the uh, Ukraine conflict and the Ukraine proxy uh, portion from Europe and the United States as really the end of uh, U.S. hegemony, empirical hegemony, and not really focusing on the conflict, but taking a look at how it played in the rise of the multipolar world. Anyway, Paul, I think that's a good place to uh, stop for this one. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, I want to thank you, as always, for being a part of this great discussion. And likewise. And to everybody here at the Sears Report, thank you for being a part of the community. Don't forget to subscribe, like, share, comment. Let anybody know if you think this has an importance. And until the next time we get together, have a great day.